Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India. Good evening. Welcome to South Asia Newsline. I'm Yeshi Chonzo. Here are the top stories we are tracking for you on Thursday, the 21st of July. Draupadi Murmu elected as India's first tribal women president. Pakistan's finance minister blames political turmoil for rupees historic downturn. And Ranil Vikrame Singh is sworn in as new president of Crisis Hit Sri Lanka. And now for all the details. Massive celebrations erupted across India after 64-year-old Draupadi Murmu was elected as the country's first tribal and the second ever female president on Thursday. Murmu, a nominee of ruling BJP-led National Democratic Alliance, was pitted against joint opposition's Yashwan Sinha a former finance minister and a BJP rebel. She will officially take oath as India's 15th president on 25th of July. 64-year-old Draupadi Murmu was elected as India's first tribal and the second ever female president on Thursday after results were announced for the voting held this week for the country's highest constitutional position. Murmu, a candidate of Prime Minister Narendra Modi's ruling BJP-led National Democratic Alliance, was certain to be elected as BJP and its allies hold a majority in the parliament and also garnered support in the state assemblies. She was pitted against opposition candidate Yashwan Sinha, a former finance minister and a BJP rebel. Congratulatory messages poured in from across the political spectrum while celebrations erupted across the country, including at her native village in Odisha state. Born in a family of the Santhal tribe, Murmu started her career as a school teacher and actively participated in tribal rights issues. She later joined mainstream politics and served as a lawmaker in Odisha state and the governor of the Eastern Jharkhand state. The new president of India will officially take oath to replace President Ramnath Kovind on July 25. The Indian constitution provides a largely ceremonial role for the president, with the prime minister and his cabinet holding executive powers. But the president has a key role during political crisis. India's main opposition Congress party, President Sonia Gandhi, was questioned by investigators on Thursday in the National Herald money laundering case amid massive countrywide protests by her party workers. Sonia Gandhi and her son Congress leader Rahul Gandhi have been accused of forming a shell company and illegally gaining control of property worth 300 million US dollars. India's Financial Crime Fighting Agency Enforcement Directorate on Thursday questioned Sonia Gandhi, the main opposition Congress party president, as it investigates a nine year old complaint of money laundering in the National Herald case. Chaotic scenes were witnessed as several senior leaders and workers of the Congress held protest in capital New Delhi and other major cities against the summing. 75-year-old Sonia Gandhi and her son Congress leader Rahul Gandhi have been accused of forming a shell company and illegally gaining control of properties worth 300 million US dollars in the case filed by a lawmaker of ruling BJP, the Bharatiya Janta Party. Congress leaders termed it as a political vendetta by the BJP. Some of them were also detained by police. Massive protests were also organized in Chandigarh, Mumbai, Nagpur and Bengaluru by Congress workers, who raised slogans against BJP, blaming it for misusing central investigative agencies. BJP leaders refuted the allegations and criticized the protests. The assets in question had belonged to a firm that published the National Herald newspaper founded in 1937 by India's first Prime Minister Jawaharlal Nehru, who was Rahul Gandhi's great-grandfather. A news from Pakistan. Pakistan's Finance Minister Mifta Ismail on Wednesday blamed the country's political turmoil for the current decline of the Pakistani rupee, which has plunged to a record low of rupees 225 against the US dollar. 
He said he expects market jitters over the currency's sharp decline to subside soon. Pakistan's finance minister Mifta Ismail on Wednesday blamed the rupee slide on political turmoil as it plunged to a record low of rupees 225 against the US dollar. He said he expects market jitters over the country's sharp decline to subside soon. The country recently passed through another bout of political instability with the government of Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif taking over from ousted Premier Imran Khan in April. The rupee downturn is not due to economic fundamentals but political instability, Mifta told reporters. He said imports which put pressure on the rupee have been curbed and the current account deficit has been contained in the first 18 days of the new fiscal year this month and pressure on the rupee would ease moving forward. And in the last year, the rupee has appreciated the yen. But the dollar has been increased because the dollar has increased in all currencies. The dollar has historically increased in this generation. Once in a generation, the increase in the dollar has come. The dollar has been high for 22 years. The rupee fell 2% on Monday and 3% on Tuesday despite last week's staff-level agreement reached with the International Monetary Fund that would pave way for a disbursement of $1.17 billion under resumed payments of a bailout package. Pakistan is in dire need of funding to shore up its foreign reserves that are now as low as $10 billion. US dollars. In news from Sri Lanka, veteran politician Ranil Vikrabe Singhe was sworn in as Sri Lanka's new president on Thursday, a day after winning a vote in parliament and urging the island nation to come together to find a way out of its worst economic crisis in decades. Ranil Vikramasinghe was sworn in as the new president of Sri Lanka by the chief justice of the country on Thursday. The six-time Prime Minister won 134 votes in the 225-member parliament in a vote count on Wednesday after his predecessor Gurdabaya Rajpaksa fled the country and resigned from his post last week after mass protest over his handling of the economy. The country of 22 million people has been crippled by a severe financial crisis with a lack of foreign currency, leading to shortages of essentials including fuel, food and medicines. Only a handful of people were present outside the presidential secretariat on Thursday, a colonial-era building that was stormed by a sea of protesters earlier this month, along with the president and prime minister's official residences. But some have vowed to fight on against Vikramasinghe. What we want to do is keep, uh, keep on going. We won't give up because what the country needs is a total uh, system change. Or different, I mean, we want to get rid of these corrupted politicians. So that's what we are doing. So we'll hang up. I mean, we will, uh, we will not give up. We will stay. Let's see what's going to happen. Hours after winning the parliamentary vote on Wednesday, Vikram Singh appeared to distance himself from the powerful Rajpaksa family that has dominated politics in Sri Lanka for decades. Vikram Singhe, who earlier served as Prime Minister and Finance Minister under Rajpaksa, has been involved in negotiations with the International Monetary Fund (IMF) for a bailout package worth up to three billion US dollars. Sri Lanka is also looking for assistance from neighbouring India, China, and other international partners. Moving on to news from Afghanistan. The United Nations mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, has released a report outlining the human rights situation prevailing in Afghanistan over 10 months since the Taliban takeover. The report said the ruling Taliban were responsible for extrajudicial killings, tortures, arbitrary arrest, and inhuman punishment since seizing power. The United Nations mission in Afghanistan, UNAMA, said on Wednesday that the ruling Taliban were responsible for extrajudicial killings, torture, arbitrary arrest and inhumane punishments in the 10 months since they seized power. The UNAMA report said the violations were targeted at a number of groups including those associated with the ousted government, human rights defenders and journalists. Women's rights had also been eroded, it said. The uh, UNAMA's report uh, highlights uh, concerns, concerns with regard to ongoing extrajudicial killings, arbitrary arrests and detentions, torture and ill treatment, denial of women and girls' rights to participate in many aspects of daily and public life, restrictions on the media, 
and civic space and the situation and places of detention. Zabiullah Mujahid, a Taliban government spokesperson, however, rejected the report's findings, calling them baseless. Taliban officials have in the past said retribution attacks were not happening with their leadership's consent and that they had barred fighters from such actions. While the statement acknowledged steps taken by Taliban authorities apparently aimed at protecting human rights, as well as a significant reduction in armed violence, it said authorities also bear responsibility. Inama particularly mentioned the role of two bodies in violations, the Ministry of Propagation of Virtue and Prevention of Vice, as well as the General Directorate of Intelligence. The report said the hardest hit victims were those associated with the former government and its security forces. Yunama also stressed the erosion of women's rights. With beautiful landscape and historical monuments, Bamiyan province in central Afghanistan was once a popular destination for tourists when the war-torn country was peaceful half century ago. It has been doing its best to reclaim its title with returning peace. Though on the path to recovery, poor facilities and scarcity of accommodation still remain a challenge. <laughs> Once a popular destination for tourists, Afghanistan's central Bamiyan province has been gradually recovering from the war aftermath to attract sightseers. But the scarcity of accommodations has become a new problem. Bamiyan province boasting pleasant weather, beautiful landscape, the Bande Army lakes, historical sites and above all, the giant Buddhas was a popular tourist destination about five decades ago. It has been doing its best to reclaim its title as a tourist destination with returning peace. The provincial head of information and culture said tourist footfall has increased in recent days. <laughs> تقریباً بالاتر از 60000 نفر بود که در بامیان آمده بود. اینجا البته دمی روزا تقریباً یک روزی 500 نفر یا 600 نفر گفته میتونیم که آمده تا هنوز خوب این فرس پس از فردا انشالله ما انتظار زیر داریم که بالاتر از 1000 باشه که در روزان هم اینجا بیانه. The mountainous province has yet to accommodate tourists and guests as there are few hotels and rest houses for the visitors. Despite challenges, tourists expressed happiness over their visit to Bamiyan. According to local officials, tourism is booming as hundreds of cars and vehicles bring in sightseers to the picturesque lakes of Bande Amir every day. And some 40,000 tourists, including foreigners, had visited the national park Bande Amir recently. As India and Pakistan mark 75 years of their independence and the partition in its aftermath, a 90-year-old Indian woman visited her home in Pakistan for the first time since abandoning it in 1947. Her family was among the millions whose lives were thrown into turmoil by the partition. She said the 75 years of rivalry should end now. Reena Verma, a 90-year-old Indian woman, waved to the media and recalled her playful childhood on Wednesday as she visited her home and childhood neighborhood in Pakistan for the first time in 75 years during a long-awaited visit. Verma said she has a vivid memory of the day when she, at the age of 14, and her family left a two-story home tucked away in the narrow, dark alleys of Rawalpindi city where residents showered her with rose petals on her arrival. After spending some hours inside the house where she had lived with her parents and five siblings before the partition, Verma said she was happy to see it had not changed much. The 75 years of rivalry should end now, she said, as she urged both the countries to ease visa requirements to enable people to cross over borders and meet frequently. Verma's family fled to India's western Pune city shortly before the partition of India and Pakistan in 1947. 
which is known as the world's largest migration. She got a visa only after decades of attempts. The 1947 partition marred by violence and bloodshed forced millions of families to migrate and has changed their lives ever since. After then ruling Britain ordered carving out two countries on the basis of majority Hindu and majority Muslim population areas. Well, that's all we have for you from South Asia this evening. Now, our viewers can watch the show on SouthAsianewsline.com. You can also visit us on Facebook.com slash AsiaNewsline and follow us on Twitter at AsiaNewsline. That's all in tonight's edition. We will see you same time tomorrow. Good night. Tag TV brings you daily news bulletin from India. Breaking news and views from India.